Overcompression leads to mixes that crackle, squeak, pump, insert adjective here. And while loudness is important in electronic dance music, new producers often overcompress their mix without even realizing it. And here's how that happens. So compression makes a sound louder by turning down the quiet parts and bringing up the overall signal with makeup or output gain to compensate, meaning that the quiet parts are actually now louder. The problem is that this makeup gain tends to be what makes a compressor sound so good because it's louder to our ears. We tend to slap it on everything, our drums, our basses, even our vocals. And it, doing this too much, however, is actually where we get not just loudness increase, but we get just flat, lifeless recordings or sounds. That being said, there are definitely still times where you do need to use compression. And there are kind of two approaches to compression I use. The first approach to using compression in your mixes and in your masters is to use a lot of it at the end just to balance everything out. With modern limiters such as Pro L2, they do a great job of basically just you can slam sounds into these limiters and it retains the apparent dynamics pretty well, which is perfect for loudness. Now, the only problem with this approach is that it's not the most ideal for your mixes and you can still get a greater deal of loudness by adding a few deliberate layers of compression at individual stages of your mix. And the first way to do this is on the individual channel level. So you've got a kick drum. You can add compression on there and control the sound a bit. The next would be at the bus level, which is where you can kind of glue all your drum sounds, glue all your bass sounds or all your musical sounds together with some light compression. And then of course, the last stage would be on your master where you can apply heavy limiting or some more compression just to even it out. And doing a little bit, but not too much at each of these stages will help you get a well massaged and balanced signal that is loud, that is even, and that sounds professional. Now you can go either way with these. I tend to prefer the second approach. Now what doesn't work is using lots of compression at every single stage. If you do go ahead for the latter approach, which I mentioned, you wanna make sure that you're massaging each sound, that you're not brutalizing it. And it's important to notice things like the samples you choose may already have compression and limiting baked into them, so there's not much point adding extra compression at the individual channel level, etc. And you've also got to remember that when you add fader, gain, uh, volume in general at any stage, it's going to increase the amount of compression that goes into the next stage. So for example, if I've got a pretty compressed kick drum that's being compressed in the sample, and you can see this kick drum here, has a little bit of compression on it. I've added a fade to kind of take some of that out, but it has compression and limiting on both the drum bus and master level. So turning up this kick drum is actually going to compress it more because it's going into the drums and then the limiter. So if I'm trying to get loudness in my kick, uh, it might not be the best way. I might have to think about turning other things down to compensate. And just so you know the best way to approach compression at each stage and that you don't use so much, I'm gonna go over five of my personal favorite rules that you can use. So the first rule is really important and it's you need to know exactly why you're using compression. Much like we know exactly why we wanna use an EQ. For example, here I wanted to cut out some of the low mids, cut out some of the upper mids and some of the highs at a specific frequency there with some dynamic. It's the same with compression. You need to know exactly why you're using it. Is it to tame transients? Are you trying to bring the, the punch out of a sound? Are you trying to control it so it sounds more even and flat? You know, are you trying to add color to it with a compressor? You know, you need to be very explicit on what you're trying to achieve. And if it's just, I wanna make the signal louder, cause that's what most people think compression does, it's probably not a good reason to use a compressor. You're probably just better off, you know, turning it up. And a really good way to help you understand exactly how and why you're using a compressor is our free compression cheat sheet. This dives into each of the controls and gives you some practical ways in which you can actually use compression in your mixes. So if you wanna download our compression cheat sheet, check that out in the description right now. I'll leave a link for that. The second rule is to fix it early rather than later. Now this comes back to the same kind of theory with sample selection and that sort of thing. It's just simply better to have sounds that are good from the start rather than having to try and fix them with bus processing and master processing or even really individual channel processing. For example, I think it's far better to have an already compressed kick drum and snare rather than trying to rely on the drums bus to do that for you. So my approach is this, once I've got a good sounding sample with the right amount of loudness, I tend to balance all of my drum samples, my bass samples, everything together uh, at a good level. 
I then add some light compression on the buses of those. The compression, for example, I'm using here on the drums bus. It's doing around two or three dB of gain reduction which is not a lot. It's really just gluing all the drum sounds together. It's not designed to bring up the loudness and to you know squash the transients much. And then I balance the buses so that my drums and my bass, you know, they are both sounding good together. If I just quickly solo them here for you, you can hear what I mean. And then once they're balanced well, I then rely on my master to do any final limiting and just even out the overall mix. And I think, you know, relying on faders as well for the compression effects you're going for is gonna give you much cleaner the results than, like I said, the former approach earlier in this video to just let the limiter do everything. I think having intentionality about what you're doing in each stage is gonna help you end up with a much cleaner mix. If you're finding this helpful so far, make sure to hit that like button down below and subscribe for more stuff like this. And another big rule I like is I tend to use no more than three stages of compression. Now, sometimes I will supplement this with clipping or some form of limiting, but I'm never really using more than one full band compressor per channel. And you can actually see, for example, on the bases here, I'm using saturation and multiband compression, and I will kind of go over this in a second because this is more for a sound design purpose. But you know, I'm not using compression for a mixing purpose here. On the bus, all I'm doing is using a bit of limiting just to control the bass and make sure it doesn't go over zero dB and make sure that all the bass sounds are even. And even more importantly on the drums, I'm using some limiting and compression, but the compression here is just to glue it all together and the limiter is just to catch the peaks. And each of them, again, is not doing a lot of work. Um, and you can see here, I've only got one actual compressor working. If I had three compressors, it would just not work and it would brutalize the sound way too much. Even on the individual channel, like I'm, I'm not even using much compression in actually some cases I'm using transient designer to bring the pop out of it, some of the snares, you know, to actually undo the effects of what's inside the sample. And even on the master here, I am once again using multiband, which I kind of see as a different effect. Uh, and that's just doing a bit of subtle work anyway. But again, there's only one actual compressor on here. The rest is limiting or multiband, you know, that's because I, again, I don't need a lot of compression here to get the loud sound I'm going for. It's just a massage effect. It's just to make everything sound like one unit. And again, that comes back to me knowing exactly why I'm using compression. And I'm also using this as a bit of a clipper too. So it's not just to compress the sounds, it's also to catch the peaks and to make sure none of them go over zero dB. So it's just really important that at each of those three stages, the individual channel, the bus and the master, I'm not using three or four compressors. I'm just using one at each stage. And it really helps me be deliberate with the end result I get. And if you do wanna go more into like clipping and limiting, I do have a separate video, which I'll leave in the corner for you there to check out because it's a really powerful tool as well to control your dynamics. If you have any other ways you manage dynamics and loudness, make sure you leave a comment below and let everyone know as well. Another big thing I'm a fan of is I tend to use parallel compression as much as possible rather than 100% wet compression. And the reason for this is I can allow the original dry punchy signal to come through and kind of in the background, bring up a more even compressed version of those sounds. This is especially true with drums, but it also works well with bass sounds, sometimes in subtle ways with musical sounds, lead sounds as well. And a good example is here, this glue compressor, I actually have on 55% wet, meaning it's mostly the wet signal, but only by 5%. And the rest of it is just the original unprocessed signal. And I'm just gonna exaggerate this for you so you can hear what I'm talking about. That's with 100 and then back to zero. It just brings out the high end a little bit for me, it brings out the, the, the tops of the drums, but it's still very clean sounding. It doesn't sound like it's squashing the drums too much for me. So I kind of quite like that effect. And again, if I had it on 100%, it's a very subtle effect, but it's just a little too compressed for me. So bringing this back to 55% not only sounds better, but it allows the um, limiter at the end of the master to do a little more work, which I find is a bit of a cleaner sound anyway. I sometimes do this on like a bus as well, where you can actually insert a return track and then you can go ahead and like send your drums to that at the level you like. And obviously you would put all your compression on here at like 100% wet 
but I tend not to do that. If you do use parallel compression, the best way is to kind of exaggerate the effect and then you can dial it in at the level which sounds good to you. This is also something we cover inside mixing for producers where we go deep into parallel compression, specifically in the Rios module. So if you wanna check out more about parallel compression and dive into the real specifics of it, make sure you check out mixing for producers and I'll leave a link for that in the description as well. And the last one is to minimize your usage of multiband compression. Now you have seen throughout this particular project I'm working on that I've used it quite a bit, mostly just on the master though. I don't think I've used it anywhere else besides for like sound design purposes, which is again, I kind of see multiband for sound design and multiband for mixing as two different things. So I'm using it on the master here and this is actually a recreation of the Ableton multiband compression preset from the multiband dynamics plugin, which is this one here. I've recreated it in Pro MB. And the reason for this is, and it's the reason why I tend to minimize the amount of multiband I use is because it adds phase differences. And these phase differences can kind of weaken certain spots in your mix if you use it too much. The good thing about multiband in Pro MB is that you have this dynamic phase option, which basically allows you to keep each of these bands as close as possible in phase without uh, affecting the latency too much. So it's a bit better than just straight up multiband compression from Ableton's one. And here it's just massaging the lows, the mids and the highs a little bit. And let me just give you an example of what that sounds like. Again, you can see there's no more than 3 dB of gain reduction on any of these bands using a very low ratio of like 1.15 to one. And, and even then I'm actually just scaling back the mix of this a bit. So it actually scales back the ratio is just a little bit more and it's a bit of a lower threshold. So we do get that more squashed sound, but it's just really controlling everything a tiny bit at each band to make the highs a bit clearer, the lows a bit more consistent and the mids just to be not too honky. So this is a really deliberate way of using multiband compression. It's a really nice sounding preset that I can adjust exactly to the way I want. But again, I wouldn't use much more than this on a mix uh, for the mixing purposes. Occasionally I might use it on my bass mix, uh, something like that, just to give the, the highs in my bass a little bit more zest uh, and sometimes on the drums. But again, you have to be really intentional with these effects because each layer of compression you're adding is going to be having some sort of effect and too much processing does result in certain artifacts coming through that are just undesirable and do affect the cleanliness of your mix downs. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this little spiel on why you should stop using so much compression. And again, if you want that compression cheat sheet, it's just down in the description. So why not give that a little download? I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one, guys.